to mark the opening of one of our new collections, The Papers of a True Renaissance Man, Luther Batiste. This is a wonderful crowd, including several of our donors of collections, but I particularly want to welcome um, those of you who have not attended one of our events before. We opened the State of the Art Repository in 2010, and it provides wonderful spaces for researchers, collections, programming, and staff. I'm Herb Hartzler. I'm director of South Carolina Political Collections. This university has a well-deserved international reputation for our spe special collections holdings. And South Carolina Political Collections has been recognized nationally for the breadth of our holdings and our work encouraging the study of contemporary government and society. South Carolina Political Collections was founded in 1991. We currently have 114 collections, including the papers of Senators Fritz Hollins, Lindsey Graham, and 23 other members of Congress, <coughs> as well as the papers of leaders in state government, jurists, journalists, and civil rights activists. New collections are added every year. Tonight's program features a talk by USC history professor Bobby Donaldson and a response by Mr. Batiste, followed by refreshments and conversation in our galleries. And I do hope you'll take time to look at some of our exhibits, and particularly those celebrating Black History Month. At the front of Thomas Cooper Library, as you walked in, we showcased two rich and wonderful collections, the papers of Majeska Simpkins and I. De Quincy Newman, and two of our newest collections, the papers of Mr. Batiste and Anton Gunn. There's a lot going on tonight, and in fact, Mr. Gunn is speaking at an event for the College of Social Work. In our Britain Gallery, which you saw as you entered uh, this library, we have a larger exhibit of Mr. Batiste's papers. And these exhibits present just a hint of the wonderful materials that he has given us, documenting his life and many contributions. A large gallery outside the doors to my right features a sampling from all of our collections as well as a special new exhibit titled Governors at Work and Play, National and Regional Governors Conferences. Luther Batiste is a founding and managing shareholder in the firm Johnson, Toll, and Batiste. He's a leading figure in the South Carolina Bar, a proud USC graduate who worked to elect Terry Walker as our first black student body president. <laughs> Mr. Walker is expected tonight. I don't. He's here. Is he here? Great. <laughs> Mr. Batiste also helped to launch the university's Black History program headed by Tom Terrell, and I know Tom is also here tonight. Mr. Batiste's service as an important community leader includes 15 years as a member of Columbia City Council, including two terms as mayor pro tem. Some of you may know of Luther and Judy's love of art and Luther's service on the board of the Columbia Museum of Art, where he is the immediate past president. Others may only know him as host of a popular radio program dedicated to jazz music, where he shares favorite recordings from his collection, matched with an elegant narrative, placing the music in context. He is active and make, will be making regular additions to his papers for years to come, which will interfile into the collection. The collection is available as of just this afternoon on our website, so anyone, anywhere, can learn exactly what, what the collection contains. <coughs> and like so many of our holdings, this collection will prove important to generations of scholars. And I want to thank both Mr. and Mrs. Batiste for entrusting the papers to us and for being ideal donors, which indeed they have been. No one is better qualified to describe Luther's place in history and the importance of his papers than the man who convinced the Batistes that we offer the best home for his collection. Bobby Donaldson is a state treasurer. 
we at the libraries love Bobby because he's a regular patron. He makes use of our special collections, particularly those here and at the South Carolina Library. He encourages his students to visit and study our unique materials. And Bobby is certainly among the most popular professors on campus. More than just a patron, Bobby also regularly works with the libraries, helping us to acquire important collections. And truly, as I said a moment ago, Bobby Donaldson is a South Carolina treasure. And now I'll give you over to Bobby. Thank you very much, Herb. Uh, although I am a Baptist professor, I won't be long today. And although I have known of Luther Batiste all of my life, and although I have read every bit of paper in his collection, I am not qualified uh, to speak about him. It is fitting that we gather in this library where you will find the works of Frederick Douglass, Langston Hughes, Doug Eby Du Bois, signed books by James Weldon Johnson, the papers of Ida Quincy Newman and Majeska Simpkins that we gather here to add the papers of Luther James Batiste III. Those of you who know him and know him well know him to be a Renaissance man, a scholar of letters, a voracious reader, and a champion of history. Indeed, his papers belong on this campus where he labored long to make a positive difference and to set right some profound wrongs. His papers are now here, and they are joined by those of John Moore Harper, I.S. Levy, Ruby Levy Johnson, I.S. Levy Johnson, Bishop John Hurst Adams, Joseph A. Delane, John Henry McRae, and Ethel Martin Bowden. In this library, you will find uh, the three volumes of autobiographies written by Frederick Douglass. Douglass, the great abolitionist, reminds us of the value of looking backwards. He says the following, it is not well to forget the past. The past is the mirror in which we may see the dim outlines of the future. In 1937, the great South Carolinian Mary McLeod Bethune spoke before Carnegie Woodson's the Association for the Study of Negro Life in History. Mrs. Bethune said the following, if our people are to fight their way out of bondage, we must arm them with the sword and the shield, belief in themselves and their possibilities. Luther Batiste has been an avid disciple of the Bethune Gospel. Look at his collection, and you will see essays written by an 18-year-old, a 20-year-old, speeches, letters, all which are housed in this collection, where you see the brilliant conversation of a young scholar who understood that in order for us to know ourselves, that we must know our history. In one particular speech that he wrote, talk about the plight of African-American men, a speech delivered 30 years ago. Mr. Batiste understood the greatness, underscored the greatness of African history and stressed the need to impart lessons to young people. He reminded them of segregation in his hometown. He reminded them of marching and picketing in Orangeburg. And he said the following, we have a sense of duty to impart to our children that the struggle was not easy. They need this sense of history to lead them forward, to deal with a society that increasingly places hurdles in their path. <coughs> Today, we gather to celebrate Mr. Batista's sense of history. The date was May 22, 2012. He copied me on a letter to Mayor Steve Benjamin. It was a letter talking about the need to preserve the historic business district along the 10 
in 1100 blocks of Washington Street. It talked about the need to preserve the home of Andre Frederick. At 422 on May 22nd, 2012, I sent Luther a message and said, excellent. Points again to the value of history and institutional memory. I said, may we begin a conversation about preserving the LJB3 papers at the university. And I made sure I copied my friend Judy on the message. <laughs> That was at 4.22. Now, I want to stress the importance of keeping email. On the same date at 4.58, he wrote me back. And he said, if you are serious about my papers, the answer is yes. At 1.23 AM the next day, I wrote him and said, yes, I'm serious. And perhaps you can assist me in encouraging others to consider their collections in the future. With the exception of Ida Quincy Newman and Majeska Simpkins, our political collection at the university fails to represent the diversity of our state. And months later, Ramon Jackson, one of my graduate students, and I went to the office of Johnson, Toll, and Batiste to pick up boxes of papers from both Luther Batiste and I.S. Amy Johnson. Today, the collections of your house here measure five linear feet, and they continue to grow. Open these boxes, look in these folders, and you will see the making of a distinguished leader and citizen. You will see all that we know about his resume, his election to, to the city council, in 1983, his service on numerous boards throughout our community. But you'll also see something else which I think is important to underscore. You will see a young man growing up on Wilkerson Street in Orangeburg, in the shadows of South Carolina State University, a voracious and dedicated reader. You will see young, a young man who took notes at Wilkerson High School for a club that I yet not know the identity in 1965. And in the minutes of the club's deliberations, young Luther Batiste records the names of individuals who were present. And one of the names he mentions is Delano Middleton, a classmate who in 1968, on February the 8th, in Orangeburg, is killed in the tragedy of the Orangeburg Massacre. <coughs> Look at his papers and you see the making of a shrewd political operative who on this campus helped to craft and engineer the election of Harry Walker, who is here today. You see the correspondence of young Luther Batiste and Harry Wright demanding the need for an African-American studies program and calling for the hiring of people like Dean Willie Harrison, who's here, people like Grace George McFadden, and people like Bobby Donaldson. On May, 20, May 12, 1969, you read a speech that he wrote that said, these students are not seeking to destroy their universities. They are seeking to change them. For many have become bastions of institutionalized prejudice, as well as ivory towers of knowledge controlled by unsympathetic administrators. Open his papers and you'll see a letter written on December the, 17th, December the 21st, 1970, addressed to a young Luther Batiste at 616 Pickens Street, apartment C. It is a letter written by William Wright, Jr., who is stationed in Vietnam. In his letter to his friend, he says, when I get back next October, I will be out of this man's army. I will be glad, and we will party up and down. <laughs> in his papers, you'll find references to every university, 
where he played basketball with my uncle, where he received a law degree, and where he met the remarkable Judy Mitchell of Auburn, Alabama, who attended Emory with my mother and my godmother. You will see newspaper clippings and other writings of a young man elected city council who spoke out against poverty and drug proliferation, who walked out of a meeting of city council to protest the lack of minority business contracts, who secured the passage of a resolution criticizing apartheid in South Africa. You will see a young lawyer who criticizes the appointment of Clarence Thomas and calls it a disgrace to the legacy of Thurgood Marshall. You will see a distinguished lawyer who loves Lionel Richie, Luther Vandross, James Brown, The Gap Band, Michael Jackson, Gil Scott Heron, Miles Davis, and all things jazz. You will see that he quotes Frederick Douglass regularly, Kanjufu, James Baldwin, and Benjamin Mays. You will see reference to a young lawyer who plays basketball at noonday at the YMCA. Well, he warms the bench with John Lumpkin and others at the YMCA. <laughs> you will see a letter written by a young lawyer, Franchot Brown, recommending a young student named Luther Batiste. You will see references to entertaining Muhammad Ali and Julian Bond, taking Julian Bond to the hottest spot in Columbia, the Fountain Blue on Tunash Road. <laughs> you will see all of this. And you will see the record of a man who has been described by many as, quote, a race man, an eloquent diplomat, a careful thinker, and straight as a toothpick. In one of his speeches, he said, when I speak, I want it to be meaningful, to the point. I don't like to talk just to be talking. And just in case I am violating the rule of Luther Batiste, <laughs> let me welcome him to the podium and please join me in thanking him for this extraordinary legacy.
share the celebration, including my personal family here today. Of course, my wife of 40 years and two years dating, Judy <laughs> Elizabeth <laughs> Mitchell Benson. My children, Justin and Jade. My, uh, my dad was the oldest of 12 children, and uh, his youngest brother is Keith Betsy's, who's a year and a half older than I am, and he always made me call him Uncle Keith. <laughs> my cousin, Dr. Brian Swan, who teaches at Walker, is here. recognize my 86-year-old mother-in-law, Elsie Mitchell. Uh, who's a, me a medical miracle. And uh, also Judy's aunt, 99-year-old Lucille Hutchins. And 97-year-old Elizabeth Jackson. Ferguson, James Ferguson, and Roosevelt Lanier. Church family, friends, classmates, and teachers from Christ the King Catholic School, Wilkinson High School, the University of South Carolina, and Emory University. My professional family at the law firm that are here. Uh, my law clerks, my colleagues from Columbia City Council, Columbia Airport Commission, and other boards, commissions, professional and civic organizations, and boards that I've served on, and my beloved constituents of Columbia City Council District 1. I think protocol has been set. All of them, my mom died September 16. Shouldn't have done And although, <coughs> although my parents, Luther and Mildred Batiste, are not with us, I think they're looking down with pride. I thank, I thank them for all they did to make me the person I am today. You are all a very important part of the body of work we celebrate this evening. My life can be summed up as one of ironies and improbabilities. My wife Judy, a retired school librarian, asked me if I ever thought this would be happening to me, that my life's work would be deemed of such value, to be part of a collection that students and scholars could access for research and scholarly interests? The answer was an emphatic no. During the many years I sat in the stacks and read for hours at the library at Wilkinson Hall at South Carolina State College, where my mom worked as a librarian, I never thought I would be information in a library. <laughs> Some of my classmates from high school are here, and they know I was a good student but I was not a superstar like Bertie Howard who's sitting over there and uh, who I took geometry with and she just intimidated me with how smart she was. And uh, I always had a strong thirst for knowledge. I was a conscientious, hardworking student who had a desire to be a success in life and to make a difference in the community. No one, however, would have predicted that my life path would have unfolded as it has. Growing up in Orangeburg had a very profound effect on me. The events and personalities of that time gave me my lifelong role model of Matthew J. Perry and inspired me to pursue a career of public service to my community, either as a college history professor or as a lawyer. As a young person, I often perused South Carolina State and Howard University yearbooks. I was smitten with Howard and it was my desire to actually attend college there. My parents, however, felt that I was not ready for the big city of Washington, D.C. <laughs> and suggested that I attend USC in Columbia. And if I did not like it, I could transfer. Well, as you know, I never made it to Howard. 
When I entered the University of South Carolina in 1967, it was very unlike the USC you see today. As you drove through the campus and walked through Thomas Cooper Library to get to this event this evening, you saw a very diverse student population. This was certainly not the case in the fall of 1967. It would have been improbable for me to imagine that USC would be hosting an event of this kind for me tonight. There were very few black students at USC when I arrived. My very good friend and one of my roommates, Harry Wright, now Dr. Harry Wright, said he could walk across campus for a week and not see another black student before my class arrived. Nothing was done to make our adjustment easy. In the beginning, there were no black athletes and no black organizations any kind. If you go back and look at the Gamecock, you'll see an incident that happened when Wake Forest came to play the University of South Carolina in the old field house. They had three African American players, and a group of us cheered for Wake Forest. <laughs> and, and could not understand why we were doing that. Um, many students during that time were not his.